tradition and innovation, I thought it would be timely uh, in this year's UN NGO session to discuss something which is like related to one, women, which is certainly number two, very traditional. Uh, it's about as traditional as you can get, uh, namely childbirth. Uh, and three, I wanted to talk about innovation. And I think uh, this particular topic will take all of those subjects. Um, I also wanted to introduce to Falco members um, one of the UN's most known agencies, the World Health Organization, better known to everybody as WHO. While it is well known, I do not think it has been widely recognized enough for its efforts to innovate, particularly innovation in regard to maternal care and mortality in the developing world. So why is this so important in the 21st century? Well, current statistics show the gruesome facts that a thousand women a day will die from complications during pregnancy and childbirth. Just think of it. During the length of our conference, five days, there will be some 5,000 women around the world who will die. Of those, the vast majority will occur in the developing world, with only 1% occurring in some high-income countries. Even more tragic is that most of these deaths could have been preventable. The challenge, of course, is exactly how to do it. Number five of the UN Millennium Goals was to improve maternal health, making the goal to reduce maternal mortality by 75% and achieving universal access to reproductive health by 2015. So far, the progress in reducing mortality in the developing countries and providing family planning has been too slow to actually meet that target. So there is still much to be done. The World Health Organization is on the front line in supporting countries and trying to deliver integrated cost-effective maternal care for mothers and babies. And our speaker here today, Dr. Lisa Thomas, uh, is a board-certified OBGYN specializing in family planning. She serves in Geneva as a medical officer for the Department of Reproductive Health and Research for the WHO. She has over 15 years of experience in working in over 20 countries, and she will speak today about her research and new innovative procedures to improve maternal mortality. Dr. Thomas. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you all for your interest in this topic. And I hope that we can have you know, some participatory interaction and, and discussion uh, throughout the presentation, so please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, the donor who funds my work at WHO, currently the MacArthur Foundation. And also, I uh, would like to mention that I serve at WHO as the focal point for sexual and reproductive health in humanitarian settings. So my focus for this talk is, is really more on the humanitarian context, but of course globally is, uh, we, can, we can discuss the more broader global issues. WHO is the directing and coordinating authority for health within the UN system, and we're responsible for setting, uh, shaping the research, health research agenda, setting norms and standards, articulating evidence-based policies, and providing technical support to countries in monitoring and assessing health trends. With the humanitarian work, I actually work more as an interagency uh, focal point, and so I, in addition to supporting our member states of WHO, I specifically support humanitarian agencies and other UN agencies on uh, maternal, newborn, child, uh, sexual and reproductive health in the humanitarian context. And there are some differences. We don't have the evidence base that we have globally that we, we and we're working on that, but it is, uh, we are specifically focusing on emergencies and crises. Actually, I just want to briefly step back and mention, at the bottom of the slide, there are a couple of logos. Uh, RHR is the, our Department of Reproductive Health and Research, uh, which is focused um, uh, on uh, sexual and reproductive health. And you'll also see the HRP logo. And within the Department of Reproductive Health and Research at WHO, we have a special program of research on human reproduction that has been in existence for 40 years. And basically, I mean, informally I can say that here to you, is that it was started when all the research was around the birth control pill. And we needed a global body that could, you know, scientifically and in an unbiased way research these what at that time were very controversial issues. 
And so we have the special program of research that is funded separately. We have a separate board. And some of my work, and I'm hoping more of my work, will be going into the special program of research. So when we talk about um, WHO's work in uh, emergencies, we're actually now having more of a management approach. I mean, as we all know, emergencies, crises, wars, it's, 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 it's an everyday aspect of a large part of the, of the world. And so we, um, WHO leads the global health cluster, and in humanitarian response, there's what we call a cluster system. And each sector, whether it's health, uh, food, uh, protection, uh, water, sanitation, hygiene, each sector is led by a UN agency. So WHO leads the global health cluster. Our responsibility is to coordinate humanitarian health action. And we, as I said, we're looking at this more as a management response now. So we have a Department of Emergency Risk Management and Humanitarian Response, and I administratively sit in that department as the focal point. So I represent um, women's health in that department. Uh, and we look at, we're responsible uh, for coordinating development, dissemination, and evaluation of policy and practice for emergency risk management and health humanitarian emergency response, as well as recovery. And we are looking at this more as a preventive aspect as well. Um, so we look, uh, again, my role is to set and promote the standards, norms, and guidelines for the emergency context. When we look at the development consequences of violent conflict, it's, it's huge. Uh, the World Bank, in their World Development Report, uh, just a few years ago, uh, estimated that 1.5 billion people are affected by organized violence. Uh, this includes 42 million uh, organized violence, political violence, fragility, and high levels of homicide. Um, but this includes 42 million who are displaced due to violence. Now, the natural disasters, which is, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's difficult to count these things, first of all, and the statistics are always a few years behind. But, you know, natural disasters, we're estimating anywhere from 20 to 30 million affected from natural disasters, but there are overlaps, so it's very difficult to be accurate with saying, you know, what is the global displacement figure? Um, and it's something I'm in discussion with, with our um, uh, monitoring team on how to really accurately count that. But at any rate, it's, it's millions, and, uh, and this is definitely affecting our progress in the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, the head of the World Bank actually stated in this report that, uh, first of all, no low-income, fragile, or conflict-affected country has achieved a single Millennium Development Goal, and that violence is the main constraint to meeting the MDGs. This, I'm not actually going to show a lot of photos of, you know, kind of the, the, the sadder, you know, more depressing aspect of, of the, the real context that um, uh, many of, of these people are, are in. Uh, however, just one photo, this is the uh, cholera epidemic in Haiti, and you can see there are a lot of women here, and, and you know, it, it's very important to specifically address women's issues within this context, because humanitarian agencies traditionally in the past have overlooked women, and it's just only the last few years, I would say in the last five years, there's been a tremendous paradigm shift in including reproductive health, sexual and reproductive health, in, you know, mainstreaming that within to humanitarian response. Uh, and, you know, we've made, I think, tremendous gains in that way, but what we don't have now is the evidence. So whereby in, in, in any um, outbreak of an acute phase of a disaster or conflict, we know from an evidence base what we need to do for, uh, for children's health. The first thing is a measles vaccination campaign because we know that saves lives. But we don't know specifically what women need in this context. That's part of, of my, hopefully my work in moving forward. We know globally what women need, but we don't know, we haven't been able to really study in the scientific way that other uh, populations have been studied in emergencies. Uh, just to mention, with the, with the cholera epidemic, just to highlight the work of an, another organization, MSF actually uh, set up a protocol for, um, uh, for treating pregnant women uh, in the cholera epidemic, and they were, and this is anecdotal, um, they have their data, uh, which I can't present, but um, anecdotally, they, they really were able to uh, improve the health outcomes of newborns. I mean, in cholera and in pregnancy, 
Again, we don't have the guidelines that we'd like to have. I mean, it's something that I would like to work on, um, but uh, it, it does tremendously affect the newborn and, and this uh, miscarriage, and stillbirth rates are very high uh, with cholera and pregnancy, and, and cholera is a global epidemic. With regards to the global um, estimates, this is a little bit of a hodgepodge slide uh, in that, uh, as you can see, um, in 2010, our most recent estimates, which came out uh, last fall for the 2010 year, uh, maternal mortality globally is on the decline, 287,000 maternal deaths. Uh, and, and then there, uh, some other figures are there for newborn and then stillbirths, and those years are referenced. Uh, the map is actually from the 2008 figures, but it's not changed. As you can see, the countries in dark color are, have the highest maternal mortality ratios, and these are the number of maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And it's a very common way of counting maternal mortality because it, it then um, it is a weighted uh, type of, of average. Uh, of note, uh, eight out of the 10 countries with the highest maternal mortality globally are conflict affected or crisis affected. And so we say that you really cannot address MDG5 uh, without specifically focusing on the humanitarian context. Furthermore, it is extremely difficult to count uh, maternal uh, deaths in any, anywhere, but particularly in displaced populations. In fact, our monitoring team will say, we do not count displaced populations in these estimates. And we're again in discussion about how to specifically develop tools. And uh, I mean, it would take a lot of funding, uh, but to specifically count what happened in the maternal deaths, maternal morbidity, uh, newborn uh, outcomes in the humanitarian context. Because while we know that the countries that have the highest ratios, which are based on models, uh, are conflict affected, we don't have really good ways of counting. And measurement is visibility. So just as a comparison, the countries with, um, based on our 2010 figures, the countries with the two highest maternal mortality ratios globally are Somalia and Chad. Uh, again, with uh, the numbers are, are really models and estimates. Uh, but in, you know, 1,000 to 1,100 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births, Switzerland is eight. So you can see that this is uh, a major social injustice, and uh, a lot of this is about equity. But it's not just deaths due to pregnancy uh, and childbirth, it's also all of the other uh, factors that are important. And Pam, thank you for mentioning family planning, because that is uh, one of our, the focus of our department in moving forward, is really to focus on family planning in addition to maternal health. Um, maternal and newborn health, and we're also going to be focusing on adolescents uh, because family planning in and of itself, we believe, can avert in up to 30% of maternal deaths. Um, current, also in the humanitarian context, there is a lack of security, sexual violence, uh, and leads to more unplanned pregnancies and complications from unsafe abortion. Abortion uh, is one of the leading causes of maternal death globally. We do have policies, as I said, highlighting the importance of reproductive health in the context of humanitarian response. Um, it's looked at from a rights-based issue, and like all other human rights, it applies to refugees, internally displaced persons, and others living in humanitarian settings, including the host populations. I mean, now we used to think of, of camps, and, and then all of the, the refugees or IDPs are in these camps, and, and that's no longer true. I mean, it's about 10% that are in the camps. I mean, more is very difficult to, to access uh, displaced persons who are, are really scattered within a host population and are not able to be counted or uh, ser provided services. We do have, a, again, I, I won't go into the details of our, our, our response uh, procedures and protocols, but we do have very focused interventions for reproductive health. The key, the cornerstone of that is what we call this minimum initial service package, the MISP, uh, and it has five objectives around coordination, uh, preventing uh, and managing sexual violence, reducing HIV transmission, uh, preventing excess maternal and newborn morbidity and mortality, and then planning uh, for, the term used here is comprehensive reproductive health services, 
But I mean, again, we just want to see that, that the uh, reproductive health services expand uh, to the way they would in, in other settings. This includes family planning, uh, all the other issues uh, that, that women, uh, uh, girls, and uh, young uh, uh, children and newborns need. We also, the commodities and supply issues are, are very important. Um, we have, uh, again, this is just an illustrative slide. There is, you know, quite, um, it's, it's a whole world in and of itself, the, the procurement of commodities and supplies uh, situation for emergencies. But this is one example of reproductive health kits. And the idea is we design the commodities and supplies to um, serve a population of uh, anywhere from 10,000 to a higher referral level for a period of three months at a time. And it's really meant to be implemented in the acute phase of a disaster or, or, or conflict situation. Um, we have these interagency rep reproductive health kits, which uh, we're actually wanting to integrate some of the newer innovations and technologies into. We also have um, uh, general health kits, and then humanitarian agencies also have their own health kits. So UNICEF will have a midwifery kit. MSF will have their own system. I'm sorry, MSF is Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, and so this is just an example. And again, what I will work with is, is ensuring that this is, uh, is up to date with the WHO essential medicines list that is based on the latest guidelines. And this is, this is a lot of work to keep, keep these things up and dated to ensure that the supplies are available. And also that you know, the service providers know how to, to use